Welcome, I'm Gloria Condrup, and I'm the Executive Director of the Hoffman Smokin Center for Typography. This is our last day of Design Educators Typography Intensive Deep Dive, and um, I want to thank uh, not just Google for their support and sponsorship, but I'd also like to thank the HMCT staff and Art Center College of Design, so we really truly appreciate that. Um, so today's talk Code is Creative Medium. I'm uh, changing the format a bit. I've invited Maggie Hendry, a uh, professor and chair at Art Center of uh, Graduate Program in Media Design Practices and Undergraduate Program of Interaction Design to be the facilitator and moderator and to take you through the talk with Golan and Tiga. So Maggie Hendry, thank you so much for doing this. I know that you're so excited about Goal and Antigua talking about code as creative medium. I will come back at the end of this and uh, good luck and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Gloria, and welcome everybody. As Gloria said, I am thrilled to not just discuss um, the book Coda's Creative Medium with Golan and Tiga, but really to be part of a group of educators who are looking for new, innovative, networked and collegial ways to create alternative forms of learning and integration with the kind of computing science and computational design part of our practice and having the opportunity to um, to hear from them directly and also to talk more about their book is is a real thrill um, many of you may know Tiga Brain, um, our Australian-born artist and environmental engineer. Tiga is assistant professor of integrated digital media at New York University. And her work examines issues of ecology, data systems, and infrastructure in natural and built environments. And it's been widely discussed in the press from Art Forum, The New Yorker, Art in America, NPR, The Guardian, Al Jazeera, and many blogs. Um, you may also have seen her work at the Vienna Biennale, the Guangzhou Triennial, the Whitney, or the Haus der Kultur und der Welt in Berlin, TEDx, or at the Sonar Festival. Um, I'm especially intrigued by Tiga's work with the Learn to Teach conference and also the School for Poetic Computation. Uh, I really admire anyone who can say more poetry, less demo. <laughs> and Partnering with her today is Golan. Golan Levin is the Director and Associate Professor of Art at the Frank Reitchie Studio for Creative Inquiry at um, Carnegie Mellon University. And at Carnegie Mellon, he also works very closely with the School of Computer Science, the School of Design and the Entertainment Technology Center. I think that understanding of intersectional design and education in the art fields is very precious and quite unique. Um, his work reflects that. It's rather atypical, antidisciplinary, and it's practice-based research across the arts, science, technology, and culture. And he too has exhibited widely in Europe, America, and Asia. So I would turn it over to them to share with us how educational platforms and syllabus and handbook design actually can feed that intersection of machine code, visual culture, um, that measures provocation and also a wide variety of media. So thank you, and I'll turn it over to Golan and Tiga. Thank you so much, Maggie. Um, yeah, it's so wonderful to be here, and um, the conference and the program has been really, really fabulous and inspiring. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, so uh, as, as introduced, my name is Tiga Brain, and um, I wear many hats, but I think most relevant for today's conversation is that, yeah, I teach at NYU and I teach a lot of computational art and design um, classes. And so that's sort of what we're going to focus on today. And hi, everyone. I'm Golan. Uh, I'm a professor of electronic art, as uh, Maggie mentioned, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and I do teach across a lot of different departments, including design, architecture, computer science, entertainment technology. But my home appointment's in the School of Art. And for the last... Uh, uh, 12 years or so, I've also directed a laboratory uh, that supports arts research uh, with an emphasis, but not exclusive emphasis on new media. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm thrilled to be here. And, and uh, this represents um, 
the kind of culmination of an eight-year collaboration with uh, with Tiga. If you want to <laughs> take it. Yeah. yeah, so we're going to talk today about our book project, um, Coda's Creative Medium. As yeah, as Colin mentioned, it is has been an eight-year project, and we're still friends at the end of it. So I think that is probably one of the, the biggest achievements of, of this project. But um, yeah, we we this this book addresses um, how to teach computational art and design, and it came about. Um, through a discussion that we were having at an educators conference some years ago. Um, here's the basic problem. So for, for about 50 years, computer science has held a monopoly on the design of programming education. Um, however, you know, programming is something that has made its way into art and design programs across the world. And, you know, as you all probably are, are very well aware, artists and designers learn differently than STEM students. Um, and so often you ha we have this problem, right, where artists and designers don't do well in traditional computer science courses. Um, specifically, the artists and designers tend to learn by making concrete examples rather than studying abstract, abstract principles. You know, they work in ways that are improvisational rather than planned. And they create things that are often expressive rather than utilitarian. And so these are three points that um, educator Leah Beakley has observed and written about and spoken about a lot. You know, and she um, in her work is, is sort of looking at these, these fundamental differences between the ways um, that, you know, art and designers think and learn and, and work with computation. And so our book really is attempting to address this gap in the literature of how to you know, teach in this way, how to teach people who learn in this, in this way, how to teach code through the arts. And the project um, actually began about this time of year. So I think it was mid-summer um, and Golan and I were both at the Educators Conference at IO Festival in 2013, 2013, gee. Um, and we would like, you know, standing by the snack table, planning our syllabus and talking about our syllabus for the upcoming fall semesters. Um, and we both assigned the assignment, the clock. So this is like a classic new media art assignment um, where the prompt is to display a novel representation of time. Um, and so in this conversation, we realized like this was an assignment that, you know, I got given by one of my creative coding teachers many years beforehand. And we realized that there was this sort of unwritten canon of assignments passed down from teacher to student um, that we all shared and that we were all a part of. And however, that was relatively undocumented. And so the, this book project really came about as an attempt to try to write some of these prompts and these approaches down that, you know, we'd been lucky enough to encounter. Um, you know, also just, you know, as you can hear, I'm Australian. And so I think it's also worth noting that like, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of these sorts of practices in North America. Um, in Sydney, where I was um, educated, you know, there's sort of a small handful of people doing this kind of work. So, um, you know, having access to teachers or mentors who are working in this way is something that um, it can be difficult depending on where you're located. So our project is also very much addressing that. Um, oh, so maybe to, to yeah. Just, yeah, just to kind of to summarize, mm -hmm. like what we're going to be presenting today, just kind of want to sort of give a quick sort of almost like an index or a table of contents to what we'll be talking about um, with uh, sort of what is this book that we've made and why did we make it and what are its key sort of key distinguishing features. And as you'll see that that we like as Tika was mentioning like this clock assignment, we realized there were a number of these different things that that our peers all sort of shared informally uh, swapped back and forth, but that weren't written. Uh, and so we've we've kind of extracted from decades of our peers' syllabi uh, this kind of canon of creative coding prompts uh, that we have taken from um, the community and give back to the community in the form of this sort of distilled book. Um, uh, I think it's in this sense it's a playbook for educators and not necessarily students. And uh, we'll talk more about like why make a book for educators. Um, the the book features assignments uh, which have no right answer 
um, exercises which have several right answers and a bunch of interviews with our peers. And this is, I think, a significant departure from computer science education in concerns programming because to, to present problems that have no right answer is, I think, oftentimes not a part of a, of a computer science uh, court classroom. Uh, and it also sort of ties together with, you know, decades of research uh, you know, coming from sort of constructivist research you know, connected to what you might call project-based learning as a way of, of kind of getting people to understand, in this case, code. Um, uh, the assignments that we show are illustrated um, or by sort of uh, compelling responses that we've curated from, uh, from work that, that people have done all around the world, whether by students um, or by you know, professional artists, uh, sort of featuring diverse approaches, conceptual approaches and material and technical approaches by diverse creators. Um, and maybe what will surprise some people is that for a book that's called Code is Creative Medium, there's no code in the book um, uh, to avoid obsolescence. Uh, it does have a, a polyglot uh, you know, repository online uh, of code, but we've made the interesting decision to, to not sort of commit rapidly obsolescing uh, code in any given language to dead trees, uh, but rather let the assignments kind of stand as uh, alone as, as conceptual prompts. So the question of why make a book for teachers? Um, and this really came about because, you know, there are so many texts for students that include worked answers in code uh, and the specific details of different programming languages. But there are surprisingly few resources for teachers, particularly those who are trying to combine like arts and engineering or design and, you know, computation in a syllabus and navigate, you know, those kind of two worlds, one um, coming more out of the sciences and the engineering mindset and one which, you know, is hinged on creativity and expression. Um, and yet, you know, so many of us teach, right? We teach to sustain our creative practices we teach alongside as a way to like feed our creative practices. Um, and universities, I mean, in my experience, uh, tend to not offer so much training in how to teach. So, you know, there's in, we, we have graduates leaving MFA and PhD programs who then find themselves in classrooms um, without, you know, a huge amount of mentoring or guidance in this domain. And this, you know, results in trying to reverse engineer the classes or the assignments of your favorite teachers and thinking back on what, what um, resonated with you as a learner. And so, I mean, this was the person we also really have in mind with this book is, you know, someone who is coming out of a, a graduate program and trying to figure out, you know, what makes a good assignment? How do I scope that? Um, what makes a good exercise that's gonna hone technique? Uh, how do you manage the energy in a creative classroom? Something that's obviously been further complicated by COVID. Um, but we were really like thinking about what the needs of, of these, this group of people um, are. Especially uh, when, um, and I know this has certainly happened to me and, and I know it's happened to others. Uh, you find out August 15th that you're gonna be teaching a class starting in two weeks and you've just come out of an MFA or other graduate program and you're, you know, you're like, okay, great. I've got two weeks together to, to whip together a, a syllabus. You know, um, what, what kind of resources, community resources can I tap into to do that? Um, and so we were inspired by uh, several other compendiums of assignments. There are a few and they're, you know, some of my favorite books. So these include books like Taking a Line for a Walk by Nina Palm, and that was um, published uh, 2016. And one of my absolute favorites, Draw It With Your Eyes Closed, The Art of the Art Assignment by Petrovich and White, which was from um, 2012. You know, and in there, they have a, this beautiful afterward in the text that I really recommend reading if you haven't come across it already, but they discuss, you know, the rise of publications around art pedagogy um, but observe, you know, and I quote, what disorientated us was how little attention was paid to the nuts and bolts of teaching, the effectiveness and applicability of certain classroom strategies, coping mechanisms for the psychological toll of being a diligent instructor, and ways to teach a subject that resists straightforward explication. And so what we realized we wanted was a book of assignments. And so we were very much inspired and, and working um, to fill that same blind spot in, in the resources out there of, of the nuts and bolts of teaching. 
Um, here are a couple more. Yeah, there's a, there's a handful of other people who've had sort of the same uh, idea. This one on the left is brand new, uh, Wicked Arts Assignments. The photographer's playbook considers, you know, 200 assignments in photography specifically. Many of you may know Yoko Ono's Grapefruit, which is old uh, and kind of a legendary classic of, of, um, uh, of sort of prompts. Um, and also teaching for people who prefer not to teach is sort of full of prompts to kind of disrupt how the classroom is conducted. And there, there unfortunately aren't enough books like this that are made for teachers. In fact, when we, when we proposed uh, a book like this to various presses, um, including our own press, you know, the immediate response was like, well, why not make a book for students? There's a bigger audience. You know, more people are, are going to buy a book if it's for students. And um, it's hard to kind of stick to your guns and say, well, really, we're, we want to make a book just for educators. And we hope that the impact of the book will be sort of secondary to a larger crowd. Another thing that really became clear to us is that unlike works of art, educational assignments are rarely considered worth saving or worth publishing. And so, you know, this, this knowledge and these practices are often not captured and recorded. Um, and the situation for digital media is even more dire. And this is something that just, you know, was devastating for Golan and I as we worked over, you know, a five, six year period putting this book together, um, where a lot of syllabus are hidden behind courseware firewalls, but also just, you know, media art projects, particularly internet-based practices, just disappear off the internet. So we would, you know, come back after a couple of months and be revising a draft or revising an assignment. And then, you know, half of the aspirational examples that we're writing about have like disappeared off the, off the internet. Um, are victims of bit rot, you know, or would return like 404s because I don't know, the artists hadn't paid their hosting or something. Um, so, yeah, I think there's there's one of the goals of for us as well was to sort of document these practices that are and these projects that are really fragile because of because of the medium. One of the key concerns we had when when making this book, and this is sort of in response to all of the the wonderful books that exist out there, um, even you know in our own creative coding discipline, like books by by Casey Reese and and others that sort of or 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 McCarthy or or so on that that deal with the nuts and bolts of teaching something like processing or p5js um they teach um you know how to make something with for loops or arrays but they don't necessarily discuss what's worth making and why and um we felt that, that was a uh, kind of a, a missing piece of um uh of that you know the, the creative coding community has done a great job on the how and lowering the bar to entry has been like one, one of the major impacts of the the sort of the processing lineage. Um, but this has also led us to sort of equally important questions about, about what's worth making and why. And this is particularly important as tools rapidly change. We're, we're in a world where, you know, what was something a PhD might have done five years ago can now be produced by a beginner with, you know, an artist friendly toolkit like ML5JS or something like this at the click of a button. And in some sense, these questions of the what and the why become even more important. Do you get any more? Um, absolutely. And um, I think the question of why uh, is also like, you know, of key importance in my own practice, but I think is something that has been, um, deserves a lot of thought in, in practices that are engaging with technologies, right? And a lot of the works we're talking about and that we share in the book are really looking at technology and politics, looking at ways that um, we can invite students to sort of critically consider the tools that they're using um, and how they, you know, shape certain ways of thinking, shape certain worldviews. The biases um, they may they entail, yeah. Yep, absolutely. Um, and also ways to sort of probe uh, black box systems, right? So we are living at a time where so much media and so many of our experiences uh, you know, happen on these platforms that are really hard to interrogate and really hard to understand um, you know, the logic behind them. And so you know, a lot of the projects that we discuss in this text are sort of uh, attempts at trying to sort of poke these systems, understand how they work and show us some of the logics and some of the ways that they're sort of 
um, changing the world. I think it's also worth pointing out that although, I mean, I, I call myself a new media artist, these media are no longer quite so new. Um, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, computational art is older than acrylic paint, right? The first exhibits of, of, of computer-based arts were in, what, 1965 and the early 60, you know, more than 50 years ago. Um, that um, just that we can now kind of look back on this 50 year history and think about sort of some abiding themes in new media arts and kind of distill those as well. So these are themes like generativity, right? As a kind of a core principle or interactivity or you know, con connectivity, network-based network uh, practices of, of communication um, uh, or virtuality. Uh, or audiovisuality, sort of transmediality, sort of community, you know, that these are abiding themes now that, that new media arts have been, been thinking about for 50 years, and they become sort of the subject for the curricula that we, we present. So let's dive in. We talk about some of the, um, some of the kind of pro the contents of the book and the kind of assignments that we give. Yeah, so the core of the book, um, uh, two dozen prompts for assignments. So these um, are projects, you know, that could be sort of expanded out to cover like a number of weeks of, of semester, uh, and they have no right answer. Um, so we've compiled these from our peers. Um, we exhaustively catalogued more than a thousand assignments given by educators to their students by looking across platforms like open processing and sort of um, documenting what, what briefs were being given. Um, and each of the assignments uh, has these sections that they, uh, we, we outline a brief, learning objectives, variations that um, would be ways to modify the assignment for different skill levels or perhaps um, modifying it to address a slightly different medium. Uh, and then there's a section called making it meaningful for each one, which discusses how the prompt connects to abiding themes in arts, history, and culture. So picking up on some of the themes that you just mentioned, Golan. Um, and here's a spread uh, from the face generator assignment that's also showing the illustrated collection of projects that feature a diverse, appro diverse approaches from diverse practitioners. So, you know, the, the project to create um, software to generate faces is aligned with data visualization works such as the classic 1970 Chernoff faces or Heather Dewey Hagbog's 3D prints that she derived from found DNA on the street. Um, and so exploring issues of like biological surveillance and, and what information um, can be sort of discerned from DNA. Um, through to more expressive projects, so like Kate Compton's cartoon faces that you see up on the top right, it is for me. Um, or Carolina Sebecker's interactive animal puppets. Um, some of the work is, you know, much more political and much more gripping, such as faces carved into aspirins by Hyphen Labs, which is that full page image you see there. And this work represents um, data for, that that's documenting American opioid deaths, opioid deaths, sorry. Um, uh, for, yeah. for, for projects that illustrate our assignments, not, not every project that we choose is famous. Um, and this is a case in point, the project here, which is illustrating uh, a data self-portrait or quantified selfie, the sort of title page here is a student project. Um, uh, we, we choose these, um, you know, in, in oftentimes in place of sometimes some very no, well-known and, you know, master, masterful works uh, because we're choosing, we tried to choose projects that had sort of what we call pedagogic value, uh, projects that were compelling, but also easy to explain so that an instructor in the classroom um, could kind of efficiently communicate to a student what uh, example responses to a prompt could look like. Um, uh, and that would also demonstrate a sort of, you know, a range of conceptual concerns and approaches to media. Um, so this data self-portrait project, um, Tiga, you want to? Right, so this, uh, yeah, the data self-portrait spread that you're looking at um, is an assignment to uh, visualize data that presents insights about yourself. So this is a prompt for students to go out and collect a data set about um, their behaviors or their living situation or something um, that reflects themselves. 
Um, they, uh, you know, they may use pre-existing data such as an email archive or um, data from a fitness tracker or something like that. Um, they might even create a new system for collecting this, right? So there is this sort of um, breadth there that can invite students to think about measurement and the ways that collection, you know, takes place or, um, yeah, happens. And so then the prompt is to create a visualization of this data that helps answer a question about yourself. So, you know, with the key being like building some new insight. Um, so the aspirational examples, some of these ones you see on the page here range from um, sort of non-computational responses to this assignment. So um, the top right there is a work called Dear Data from Georgia Lupi and Stephanie Pozovec. Um, they have a book on the same on the same project. And this project consisted of postcards that they sent each other with drawings um, of data from their, their lives. And so every week they would sort of exchange postcards to form this collection. Um, we also really tried to look at uh, maybe under attended histories or under, under attended artists. And so um, the work Sonia Rappaport's Biorhythm, which is that work in the middle there, you see with the SMTW, yes, as indicated. You know, this is a work from 1981 that's really addressing the quantified self. Um, and so Rappaport used a commercial kit to predict her daily biorhythms and then compared her own experience with the computerized predictions, really preempting, you know, the data driven moment that we're living in now. Um, so we yeah, definitely tried to sort of present a range of works from, from the sort of history of um, this prompt, each prompt. Um, just personal one more prosthetic, yeah. to show you, yeah, personal prosthetic. And so we also have a few assignments that sort of take computation into physical space. So this would be an assignment that would be great for a physical computing class. Um, some of ours also look at, you know, digital fabrication practices, so trying to leave the screen. Um, and the personal prosthetic is a prompt that asks students to develop some kind of prosthetic device that responds to the wearer's behavior or environment or situation. Um, and so this is an opportunity to steer a syllabus or steer a class um, to look at issues of the body, issues of accessibility, maybe touch disability studies, um, or think about performance in public space, right? As, as these works play out in different places. And so there's works here by Sarah Hendren, Chris Wobkin, um, to name a few there. Um, so I, I, yeah, finally. Yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do a, a deeper dive here right now, just for a moment on um, one of our assignments that connects particularly with typography. Um, and this is called Modular Alphabet. I actually just saw this sort of similar concept referred to just yesterday as, as molecular typography. Um, the premise is to design, in this case, a typeface, a computationally uh, you know, rendered typeface, uh, such that all the letters of the alphabet are structured by the same software parameters and the same graphic logic. Uh, for example, a student might design an alphabet in which every letter is exclusively constructed from three arcs or from four rectangles. And uh, I think this is an ideal way to teach about meta design, about data storage, parameterization, and design within very tight constraints. Um, so um, there's a long history to this premise, going back um, to some of this work over here uh, from uh, uh, Friedrich Seneken, who in the uh, 1870s attempted to rationalize German typography by uh, sort of replacing the German fracture uh, typeface with uh, a new a new typeface based on arcs and straight lines, circular arcs exclusively and straight and straight lines, which actually led to uh, ultimately the, the sort of the German DIN uh, type system. Uh, and you may also recognize uh, Bruno Minari's wonderful work ABC with Imagination, which was a 1960 children's book. Uh, alphabet book with a, that included a set of modular uh, wooden pieces. One of my favorite examples of this kind of idea was uh, as a project by Mary Huang called Typeface, a typographic photo booth over here in the upper left, which is a font whose parameters are controlled by signals uh, that are governed by a real-time face tracker. Um, and uh, and then, but the the formulation of the assignment as we've positioned it here is it actually mostly comes from John Maida, uh, who was my teacher and was mostly inspired by a specific 
project by a then colleague of mine, Peter Cho, who was a student in the same class. And uh, what became a classic work called Type Me, Type Me Not back in 1997. And that's this animation you see here uh, in which every letter is constructed from two Pac-Man filled arcs. Um, and you can represent every single letter in the alphabet with just 10 numbers. And by interpolating between those numbers, you can smoothly move from any letter to any other. So I, I gave this assignment myself in 2006. Here are some of the results from, from back then. Uh, from These were from you know, second year undergraduates at Carnegie Mellon, uh, including a sort of Halloween themed uh, alphabet in which every letter is made from three bones, uh, for example. And um, this is from beginner students, uh, but the same uh, assignment in the hands of a, a more sophisticated or advanced student uh, can produce interesting and compelling results as well. And I think, uh, in my opinion, a good assignment is open-ended enough to be challenging for a creator at any level, whether introductory or advanced. Uh, so this is uh, the same assignment interpreted by my advanced student, uh, Ling Dong Huang, who devised something that he called recursive radical packing language. Uh, it's a way of representing and constructing every Chinese character using a kind of a nested collection of modular pieces. Um, and uh, it's actually a kind of a really fantastic system. He was able to encode more than 5,000 characters uh, using it. Um, so, Tiga. That's such an incredible assignment. Um, so just stepping back, uh, the exercise section in the assignment is more orientated towards, I guess, developing students sort of technical understanding of um, programming. Uh, so these exercises tend to have several right answers, um, and there's over 100 of them uh, sort of organized in different topics uh, throughout the book. 200, um, actually. 200. <laughs> Many. <laughs> um, so there's small prompts, you know, they're really great for giving in class um, and having students work in class or giving for homework and, you know, um, designed to be sort of done over the course of a day or so. Um, and they familiarize students with the grain of new media art and design. And so the ones you see on the screen there are some of my favorite, and I love to do these on the first day of class, which is computing without a computer, right? So they're, they're prompts to give students in groups. Uh, they, can, they are often uh, address drawing or procedurality. Um, ways to encode, you know, the complexity of the world into sort of a rule-based system. So there's a whole series of them which are really great exercises, also just to help students, you know, get to know each other and interact. Something that can be a bit challenging when it's all screen-based um, learning. So um, what then follows are in this section these uh, these very short exercises, right? And and they they range uh, across a wide range of sort of creative coding basic skills. Uh, and one of them is, for example, sort of mastering the control of basic graphical elements like, you know, lines and shapes and circles and triangles and things. Um, and uh, there's not necessarily a right way or only one way to, as Tika pointed out, to, to execute these things, but they get people familiar with their, their toolbox. Um, uh, we also talk about iteration, you know, with sort of foundational or sort of any kind of creative, code, creative coding class is going to um, to touch on these, but we we leave it to the you know the current toolkit or the future toolkit that people are teaching with. You know, the the prompt is to make seven circles that go across the screen or the page, wherever it might be. And today you might use processing or P5JS, but in ten years it might be something else. Uh, the problem is still one of thinking about procedurality and iteration, and uh, we hope that's something that will have some kind of longevity to it. Um, some more here visualization. So this would be uh, great for a data visualization module or class. Um, and if maybe make a pie chart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you know, sort of we tried to um, look at the, the classic fundamentals of, of visualization. And uh, maybe most relevant for this, uh, this group is typography. So this is the group of typography prompts. Um, and here we're, 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 we're looking at typography. These are very tiny exercises, but they're typography exercises that deal with sort of the full scale of how typography might sort of intersect with computation, uh, whether it's sort of fiddling mathematically with the, the, the manipulation of the, or the outlines of individual glyphs to generative typesetting, uh, 
or expressive forms of interactive wordplay, you know, like having a word, for example, like uh, that responds uh, interactively to the cursor so that um, if the word is avoid, you know, the word of literally avoids the cursor, or if the word is tickle, then maybe, you know, the, the user appears to be tickling the word. So getting expressive typography to relate to, um, to uh, interaction or to computational principles is an example of these small exercises. Um, and I, I thought I'd do another quick deep dive on um, how some of the exercises which don't clearly have any specific connection to, let's say, typography, for example, could actually um, connect to professional practices out there. So it won't surprise you to learn that one of the sections in our exercises is devoted to machine learning. Um, and so here are two exercises. Uh, the first one is clustering a collection of images. And the assignment basically says to generate a 2D map that reveals similarities between things in a set. Right. And there's a kind of there's a basic core technology that's now readily accessible to creative coders called TSNI, where um, you sort of analyze, let's say, a thousand of your favorite images or a thousand of your favorite things, uh, produce some metrics that describe them, and then use this visualization technique to sort of plot them in this kind of cloud that groups similar things near each other and does sort of dimensionality reduction. Um, and so in the assignment, we imagine people might do it with, uh, you know, a personal collection of images. The exact thing in the upper left over here is actually a collection of emoji. Um, but what we see over here on the right is a project by IDO called FontMap, uh, where they're using exactly this. You can see that that they're doing this kind of thing as professionals, where they're, they're taking uh, about 700 typefaces and organizing them um, using this technique. So you can see how um, an assignment like this, you know, both reflects current practices, but also can kind of portend how people might use the knowledge they're getting from this uh, in ways that matter to them specifically, like, for example, in typography. Um, machine learning can be used to analyze things, in this case, like analyzing typefaces or analyzing images, but it can also be used reciprocally to synthesize things. And uh, this is a related assignment called More Like This, Please, uh, or exercise, in which uh, given a collection of you know, about a thousand things, maybe your favorite images of feet, let's say, you know, I can say, can I have, you know, can I train a, a machine learning system to uh, make more like this? Um, and uh, the image that's shown there is a project called This Foot Does Not Exist by a Brooklyn collective called Mischief, um, where they basically uh, synthesize feet images, um, having trained it up on a big database of feet. But the same um, kind of premise of this assignment and the same kind of literal techniques, the generative adversarial networks, can be used with readily available creative coding tools um, by uh, typographers, for example. So on the left is the Process, uh, Process Studio uh, based in Vienna. They have an AI font uh, and they're synthesizing these things by exploring a latent space. That's sort of exploring the, the in-between spaces uh, in um, the, the, the typographic space. And on the right is the Berlin-based NAND Foundry and their machine learning font. So both of these people using generative adversarial networks to, um, to synthesize typefaces. So following the exercises, there's also a section that is traces the provenance of each of our assignments. So it looks at, you know, what are the history of the prompts? You know, where have these briefs come from? What have teachers been doing, you know, prior to, prior to us or prior to, you know, the generation of sort of artists and designers that we are a part of? Now, this, this writing the section was out was quite challenging because as we've mentioned, you know, there is limited documentation of syllabus, you know, syllabus exist in university archives, on people's hard drives, you know, it's, it's not readily, a lot of it, particularly um, syllabi that are sort of older than a decade, they're not just sitting around online. Um, and so here we have done our best to sort of look at uh, where these prompts were given, first of all, and how they've sort of morphed as one teacher and has given it, and students have then, you know, um, morphed it, forked it, recontextualized it, subverted it, and, and developed it in their own practices. Um, so we, you know, we have also in that section, there are some references to syllabi, you know, we found in the 1970s and 1980s. And so yeah, there really is, I think there's really like multiple PhD projects um, in sort of unearthing some of these histories. Yeah. Um, and um, the book also has a section of interviews uh, with our peers. Do you want to talk about that, Tia? Yeah, so this section, as you can see, there's probably some familiar faces um, there for you. We interviewed um, 
real leaders in the field, people who have inspired or mentored us with their teaching, um, asking them a series of questions about sort of what are they doing in their classrooms. So we asked them questions like, you know, what is it, what's different about teaching artists and designers to code in contrast to say teaching in a computer science context or you know, how do you deal with that classroom where you have some students that are really technically competent and some who are like, you know, fresh beginners? How do you manage those two levels? Or like, you know, what's the most memorable response to an assignment that you've given? Or my personal favorite, um, which is like, you know, what happens on your worst day? So what happens when things go wrong? And so there's a lot of wisdom there, I think, um, about, yeah, how to deal with the challenges of working with technology. Uh, so I've just pulled out a couple of responses. Um, one question which asked, you know, how do you encourage meaning making, criticality and perspective in this field, which can be, you know, very techno formalistic. And so Taeyun Choi, who um, is a part of the School for Poetic Computation, one of the founders, you know, he, he states that it's look easy to retreat um, to this mode of like, we're going to help you become a coder. We're going to help you become an expert. But to me, that sounds as thin as we're going to help you become good at Photoshop. I think the real question is about finding a desire within students to master the language of technology. It's code and electronics, but it's really about expressive literacy. I want them to approach code and technology as artistic medium so that they can not only overcome that psychological barrier of I can't do this or this is not for me or like I'm bad at maths, which is a classic one, um, but, but get to a place of being creative in the medium. And so, you know, he's masterful at giving these short exercises that are really simple, like one button, one output, something where you're pressing a button that lights up an LED and then using that as a prompt for, for conceptual thinking. Uh, so he finishes, I like to show that you can make a lot of meaning with very little technology. Uh, and then one more I pulled out, which is a question of like, what do you do on the first day of class, right? You have students, some who are, you know, panicked because they think that this, the programming isn't for them. Um, and so Winnie Soon, who's an educator based in Sweden, she um, shared this with us. So I usually explain the intention of why I choose to work with particular tools. We talk about how there are different coding languages and different coding ed editors. And I'll talk about why I chose GitLab to host my syllabus, why I chose to work with P5.js, what are the priorities of this software and how are values embedded? Um, she goes on, so choosing a tool is a kind of politics and I wanna set that scene, but the course is not all about picking something because it's efficient or good and then just using it. I want you to ask why are you using it? What kind of values are you subscribing to? I think that's quite important. So there's lots of these sort of gems throughout the interviews that have been super helpful in my own teaching as well. Um, and I think this quote here really summarizes um, a goal of our book as well. Uh, so this is from Whitney Spereza, and she says, our understanding of what computational work looks like has become limited because of the history of compute, because the history of computing has been dominated by figures in STEM, but other figures and stories belong in this history too. And so, you know, this project is really about insisting and advocating for arts literacy in engineering spaces and in computer science spaces. You know, for a long time, we've heard about code literacies, how we all have to learn to code and it's really important. But I think it's also essential to um, advocate for arts and humanities in these sort of interdisciplinary spaces. Um, and so we really have tried to create a resource here that, that emphasizes how valuable arts lit literacies are for engaging with technologies in ways that are nuanced and culturally situated. So um, this is now just a kind of a coda to the talk. It's not really about our book per se, but it's about um, kind of how Tiga and I work as educators. And uh, the book that, we're, that we've offered to the, to the community uh, is made possible by free and open source uh, you know, software toolkits for, for the arts, uh, which have really revolutionized um, access and democratized who can be making art and how. Um, and we participate in those communities as well. And we wanted to just briefly mention about, you know, how um, a lot of those tools like processing and P5.js, they're not only being made, you know, by, 
by non-corporations. It's not just that they're made by non-Adobe or by open source communities. They're actually being made by educators, artist educators. And you know, it's educators who are making these tools for their students so that their students can then learn to code and learn to make art with code. Um, so there's a kind of bi-directionality or kind of a dialogue between tools and pedagogy. Um, it's not a coincidence that these wonderful, you know, well-documented tools like processing and P5JS and others have emerged from educational communities. And I want to talk for just a second about sort of how educators are extending the field, building and contributing to these open source software, software toolkits and libraries. Uh, both Tiga and I are uh, contributors, for example, to the P5JS community. This is um, the 2015 P5JS Contributors Conference uh, held in the laboratory I direct, the Studio for Creative Inquiry at Carnegie Mellon. You can even see Tiga over there on the right, and Lauren McCarthy sort of <laughs> in the middle, middle left. Yeah, many years ago. Um, but, you know, these are people getting together to kind of improve the toolkit um, for our students and for ourselves. Um, uh, we know that about a week ago, you heard from our colleague Q Ha Shim. So Q uh, designed our book. Um, Q designed our book using uh, uh, something called Basil JS. Our book, as you, you may know from from last week's presentation by Q, was computationally designed, and you know the, it, it's a kind of a nice harmony uh, because our book is so modular, broken up into these little exercises and little assignments and little interviews, that it becomes easy to sort of write a script that kind of generates the book's layout. And we were very proud to make that a part of, of how we presented our book to the world, that it was computationally generated in, in its design. Um, Q is using a set of tools called Basil.js, which you know, are created by Ted Davis and, and uh, Benedict Gross and others as educators for their students. There is primarily developed in Switzerland uh, by those folks, and they made Basil.js as a way of scripting in design so that their students could extend code to the problem of book design. Um, so yeah, Golan and I have both done similar projects uh, addressing different tools. Um, one that I developed with Sam Levine and a number of students here in my program at NYU is a P5 library for risograph printing. I'm sure most of you are familiar, but if not, you know, the, a risograph is sort of like a photocopier crossed with a screen print process. So it's a printer where you sort of separate out colors and print in layers. Um, and, you know, preparing a lot of test prints and so forth, I became frustrated with only using like Photoshop or Adobe tools to create um, the files needed to, to do um, this printing process. And yeah, we decided to embark on yeah um, creating a P5 library that allows you to do color separation and cutouts and different processes that are specifically um, orientated towards risograph printing. So you know, in the library, all the ink colors are, um, are specified, and and yeah, it's really orientated to bring computational processes to this particular printer. Uh, and so if you just go next slide, there's a couple more examples there of um, some, some work documenting the library that we did. So, you know, designing grids in Photoshop can be very time consuming. Do it with code, super um, quick and easy to do. So um, again, yeah, we've, we've sort of tried to document this best as possible and it's sort of being experimented with by students in our print lab now. Um, and coming out of my lab uh, was another project to extend code out into the physical world um, with a library called P-Embroider. Uh, so this extends uh, the code writing process to CNC embroidery. Um, as you may know, it's actually not expensive to go to the store and get a computer controlled embroidery machine. Uh, it costs $600 and up, um, and they allow you to create a design uh, and then export it in thread, in real fabric. Um, the issue is that uh, software that, uh, that for designing embroidery designs uh, is where they get you. Um, the software to design your own um, designs for embroidery can cost literally thousands of dollars. It can, they, have, they have like payment plans, monthly payment plans. It can cost $3,000 and up to, to have your own design software. And adding things like, like, like typefaces is extra. Like you buy, you buy a few hundred extra dollars so that you can have high quality typography. And when I found this out, I was just downright offended. Um, and so uh, my laboratory uh, 
created a library called P Embroider, which is work, works for processing to allow for computational design of embroidery uh, patterns. Uh, so you can write code and make for loops and so forth to export shapes and so on. Uh, what you see on the right is work by a student of mine, Hugh Messi, uh, in which there's sort of some simulated physics that are controlling these bouncing balls. Uh, and then he exports these animations uh, in terms of multi-frame embroidery files. Um, finally, um, uh, my lab, but also our friends in general have been, um, you know, we're, we're part of many communities that are concerned with uh, supporting open source software toolkits for the arts. This is a, the, a website uh, created by a, a former colleague of mine, Everest Pipkin, who was supported by my lab um, to create this resource that's called the Tiny Tools Roundup. And it's basically a huge list of open source software toolkits for the arts um, that allow for all kinds of things. Uh, there's, they have more than 800 uh, different tools listed uh, of which things like processing and P5JS are, are only but two. Um, so that's what we got for you. We wanna thank you so much for, um, for hosting us today. No, thank you. Um, I want to open this up for lots of questions, um, and I was also just going to pop into the into the chat for anybody who would like to check it out. Um, there's an accompanying GitHub for a lot of the code that goes with these exercises. And as people pop in their questions, um, I wanted to share a thought and then a question, right? And one of the thoughts is, thank you for really helping resolve an issue that I, I'm often faced with, which is the conversation can often become about, should we use Jitter or Max? Is it P5GS? And it becomes a very tool oriented um, discussion, which for some people is actually an ideology. It's a question of belief as opposed to, I believe what your book and your work offers us, which is a really concrete proposition to the student situated in material feedback and in some ways, we kind of sneak up on the learning of procedural thinking and iteration and the foundations of computational science. So I really appreciate that. And I think that's something that um, when I look at the prompts to the students, I start to tease out what is actually going to be the critique, right? Which leads me to my question. Can you talk a little bit about how we give feedback, critique, and ultimately assessment to the student, if any of the people you interviewed shared that part of their teaching practice. Assessment's really different different for me now after COVID. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I'm using the word assessment with a small a and a very, I'm holding it very, very loosely. I'm, I'd like to situate the, the thought of assessment less in our academic accreditation and more in cultivating valuable insights that help the student iterate. Did people talk about the use of critique or how, how did people do that? How do you do it? It's interesting. I think there's, I think in um, sort of computational arts or creative coding spaces, there's a little bit of a different culture of critique than one might find in sort of a straight design program. Uh, in that, I think because of the sort of brittleness of the tools, in my experience, I've found um, that, you know, there to be more like a cheering on or like a positive feedback um, trying to, to encourage students to sort of dive in and, and leave their comfort zone, maybe. Um, you know, and some of my students from architecture are kind of like shocked by this, right? Because in architecture, obviously, there's this sort of different culture where there's sort of much more direct um, criticism of the work. So I think that's worth acknowledging that I th mm -hmm. think there is a, a bit of a different culture there. Mm -hmm. um, but there are lots of tricks, right? Like, and some of these I'm, I have learned off Golan actually, which is uh, it can be very difficult to um, get students to give each other feedback. Particularly, this is also really challenging on Zoom. I'm sure everybody's in the same place with that. And so what I often do, um, and many educators who we talk to shared this too, is like set up like a Google Doc or an Etherpad or some kind of anonymous document where students during when somebody's presenting, they're just able to like write comments either attributed or anonymously to each other in sort of more of an asynchronous style, right? So that you're not 
you don't need like half an hour for each project, but there can be sort of like one or two people speaking and then this sort of asynchronous and then the student walks away with this document of like thoughts from their peers. That's worked really well for me. Yeah. Um, but I think there's always, in my classrooms, there's always this sort of like public sharing um, as a way of yeah, mm -hmm. presenting work. I've also used um, crit clusters where you partner people, like you're your crit partner, Tiga, you're going to crit with Golan and your job is to be the best crit partners possible. Um, I wanted to um, pass to a question um, from you, Han, that's in the Q&A, um, and they explain their history teaching type and code and their own thesis work um, teaching topography at UW and also um, at uh, SAI, uh, SEIC. Um, I wondered if you could speak a little bit to their question, which is around structured learning that might go from basic topography to advanced graphic design. And if you had any considerations of future publications that are more about the creative coding, specifically in graphic design. Um, there's a really good uh, book on computational typography by uh, Jörg Laney. I have it on the other side of the room. I'd have to get up and grab it, but uh, I'll, I'll plop it in the chat later. It's, um, it's really hard to find, unfortunately, uh, um, but it's, it's, uh, oh, it's called Typeface as Program. Uh, that's what it's called. Yeah. And it, it's really, it's um, a fantastic book about, about computational typography. It, it doesn't, I wouldn't say it takes you through uh, any, like a, a beginner to advanced thing. It's more just about the, the question of, of computational typography. Um, oh, you know, actually, yes, I have a, I have a wonderful answer for you. Oh, thank God. I just realized. Um, uh, oh God, my name, um, the, just a second here. Um, I'm suddenly like losing my, my names, but um, uh, ah, here we go. Um, yeah, so Rune, Rune Madsen, uh, his book is like the way to go. Absolutely. Um, Rune Madsen, uh, Rune is, I think is, is Danish. Uh, Rune Madsen has a book which is um, all about computational graphic design and it's online and free. And um, he's been releasing it chapter by chapter for the last couple of years. I don't think he's quite done yet, but it's the, the it exists already. It's, it's, it's astonishingly good. I'll find the link for you. Yeah, he's one of our interviewees as yeah. well. And he's specifically focused on graphic design. So yeah, it's called Programming Design Systems. And it, I mean, I'm actually really jealous of the book because it does it does a lot of heavy lifting that uh, we didn't get to in our in our book. Um, there it is. Yeah, thank you. Like impeccable, high, highly recommended. Like, yeah. Yep, and we'll follow up with some of those links and we'll pop them in the chat. Yeah. Um, I'm also looking at Rhonda's question, which kind of like bridging code, um, bridging the code with traditional design branding systems. Do you believe designers have to be coders? And as um, as we enter into that question, I'm asked this question a lot in interaction design, and I kind of try to unpack what people might believe the word coder to be, right? And I too, I think echo some of the feelings in your book that were, for some students, they'll find this is their passion and they will shift their center of gravity into a development kind of role. Others, it's more like, I, this is a medium and I play and experiment and break and toy, but there's this form of literacy. And I think that literacy is what I, I encourage and expect now for at least designers who work with computation at the heart of the experience they're designing. But I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Um, I think that uh... I think it's an essential part of a, of a design education in 21st century is to be exposed to it, uh, to be sure. Um, I think not every designer has to be a coder. And I think, because there's many different kinds of designers, right? There's, there's, it's just, there is, I think we have to make space for people who want to have that be their, their main tool and, and to, to know when to use it appropriately. And that's part of what our book is about is knowing, knowing when code is the right tool to use. I mean, there's plenty of examples uh, in our book where code narrowly understood as as uh, you know Java programming language or something like that is not um, is not the right tool. Sometimes it's completely analog media that have no code as we normally understand it. 
but but procedurality and these other kinds of themes that arise in you know the late 20th century early 21st century from the existence of computers is something that we can't ignore as designers mm -hmm. um, I'd also um, say that under the influence of Elise Co, who you do mention in your presentation, uh, we all went crazy a couple of years ago for knitting as, uh, as a non-computer computation and then entered into what that can mean computationally. Yeah, I mean, knitting uh, patterns are absolutely unquestionably code um, and um, anyone who can follow them is, is following a program. Mm -hmm. um, I was just reading today that it was it was probably uh, Ada Lovelace who invented the idea of generative art. By the way, I mean back in you know the eighteen forties. I mean there's there's a really long um, way of thinking about. Um, you, you said you know like what does what does coding have to look like? Uh, it does not have to look like. And part of our objective is to sort of rupture the stereotypes of who is a coder, what they look like, and 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 the kind of skills they have to have. Um, I think part of the important part of the revolution that's happened in creative coding over the last 20 years has been the ways in which, um, you know, a little bit of skill can, with the right idea and the right kind of aesthetic can be incredibly powerful without you or one having to get a graduate degree in computer science or anything like that, you know. Yeah, and I think it's also about a shared language. So, you know, most of the projects we, we do, even like art, like my art, practice involves collaboration, right? And so I might not be the primary developer on the projects, but you need a language, you need to be able to understand what's possible and work collaboratively with other folks who might have, you know, slightly different skill sets to your own. So I think that's what I'm always trying to cultivate in my students too, is that capacity to be able to, yeah, work across disciplines. Mm -hmm. I want to be sensitive to everybody's time. Um, I see Elise is there. She just says a hello to everybody. Hey, Elise. Great to see you here great, too. Great to hear you from you. I want to just say we have about five minutes left. So obviously I want to encourage anybody with any final talking points, insights or questions to pop them in. Give that a moment. Um, and Brian um, has some questions. How do you face presenting that I feel this way about something that is just as valuable as the data says this? So I realize there's a little bit of background to his question. Sub subject, it's the thing I think, subjectivity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think part of the lesson that we have as artists and designers and, you know, as, as humanists is to uh, constantly remind um, folks in STEM fields, honestly, that that all this is really subjective, that, that there's bias in everything where all the systems that we're doing, that every, the, the sort of pretense of objectivity is, is really um, one of the most problematic things actually in, 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 in the sciences. Um, and there, there, need, they, there needs to be a constant reminder of the ways in which our technologies are a product of our cultures and a product of so many assumptions. This is Tiga's expertise, I should, I should shut up. <laughs> A great book that I think might be helpful here is Data Feminism uh, by Catherine D'Ignazio and Laura Klein, I think. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, they really sort of connect feminist theory, which is about situatedness and sort of understanding these biases and how they're inevitable with concerns of data science and, and how can we sort of think about data science in a new light, um, given the work that you know, feminist theorists and, and have been doing for a long time. So that book is also super helpful um, as a pedagogical resource because, uh, you know, both the authors are teachers and they sort of give ways of introducing students to these ideas as well. So I popped um, a couple of things in the, in the chat. Um, one of the things I, I enjoy very much about working with our scientists um, here at JPL or Caltech is rather than having to defend subjectivity, I encourage them to defend objectivity, which is a very difficult thing to do in data in science. And Lorraine Destin and Peter Gallison talk about that very well. Um, it's very, and I think this is one of the spaces where I would hope that the model you show us of kind of radical collaboration can extend into some of the sciences also. Which leads me to my final question. Um, where do you see this, this kind of extended platform, the book, the code, the teaching practice and the community? 
where, where do you see your next steps? Another book, more teaching. I see holes in the book that we made. We, we released the book literally just before, we, 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 we submitted the, the final draft just before COVID. And um, I think in, you know, in retrospect, there's like some big things that have happened in the last you know, year and a half, whether that's machine learning and, and or whether it's the NFT space and, and, and blockchain stuff, or whether it's um, you know, teaching uh, remotely, uh, that I think the book is under, under attends to. And um, I, reg I, regret, I regret those, those gaps. Um, that's, that's not a big answer to what's next. It's just sort of thinking about like, like timing and how it came out. And suddenly all of our efforts to make something that was sort of hardened against obsolescence, like despite all of our best abilities, like, you know, it's, it's like already like starting to show that it's from the before times. I mean, I think publishing projects are slow. And so I feel like that's inevitable goal. Yeah. <laughs> but I think one thing I'm excited about is you know, we are seeing more of these publishing projects um, emerge that are sort of also looking at specific uh, disciplines or specific classes. So I'm uh, thinking of Winnie Soon, who we also interviewed, just released a book with Jeff Cox that's specifically looking at uh, software studies. So like, you know, more humanities focused project around, yeah, like teaching, coding, but, but for... for software studies and humanities students. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited that we are seeing, like our project, we're seeing these, these more interdisciplinary mm -hmm. resources. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And we're just at time, so I don't think we'll have time to talk so much about how COVID has changed critiques, um, but unless we have just one minute to answer that, but if not, what I'm suspecting is we have a lot of topics for ongoing conversations and I'll turn it over to you to answer the question about COVID and then back to Gloria. Um, I wish we could just continue, <laughs> but well, unfortunately- Any final comments about the I, I go, time of COVID? I wanna make a plug for um, some, a new project by Catherine Morawaki and Shin Shin called the uh, Critical Coding Cookbook. Um, this is a new book also of assignments that's being created right now. And they have an open call uh, due in just a few days uh, for contributions that interrogate, deconstruct and decolonize coding education. So uh, I've tweeted about this a few days ago, but um, if you look for the Critical Coding Cookbook, um, I'll put up a link in the chat, but uh, this, this is a really promising book that I think addresses some things that I, I'm, I really certainly wish that, that uh, we had done more of and that I think is essentially really important. Thank you. I'm sorry we have to end. To Gloria to join me in thanking both of you for an astounding eight years of work and a fabulous presentation and introduction to it. And I am looking forward to ongoing work and conversation on this. Thank you. Thanks so much for Absolutely. having us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you both for um, accepting the invitation and expect more invitations to come from us to further expand on, um, I have lots of notes to further expand on, on what we've talked about. And I know Maggie also is very excited about expanding the conversation um, with both of you and within the educational community. I think this is an imperative to do. Um, so thank you everyone for attending. And thank you, Tiga. Thank you, Golan. And thank you, Maggie. Amazing. I, I knew there was, you know, to get me and people who know me, who starts in a very analog environment, to be so enthusiastic about computational design and computational code as creativity, uh, you have definitely done something very unique. So I, I, I applaud you both. Thank you again. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks.